All right, first up, let's get you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. The first phase of India's election concluded on Friday. 102 parliamentary constituencies went to the polls in 21 states and union territories. 62% voter turnout was recorded in phase one. The Election Commission of India said that polling passed off peacefully. Six more phases of polling will take place over the next few weeks. The political parties have already begun campaigning for the second phase of election to be held on the 26th of April. On Saturday, Prime Minister Narendra Modi held public meetings at Nanded and Parbhani in the western state of Maharashtra. Highlighting the achievements of uh, the BJP, the PM urged voters to come out in large numbers for taking part in what he called the Festival of Democracy. Later in the day, the Prime Minister was to address rallies in the southern state of Karnataka. Sinchai ki samasya ke samadhan ke liye upper pen ganga project par kaam chal raha hai. Yaha ke kisano ko iska bada lab milega. Hamari sarkar ne pasal bima yojana ke tahat kisano ko premium se paaj guna jada claim dilwaya hai. किसान सम्मान निधि के तहत अकेले नांदेड़ के किसानों को ही 1300 करोड़ रुपए से ज्यादा मिले हैं इस क्षेत्र में तो ज्वार बाजरा बहुत होता है हमारी सरकार ने इस मोटे अनाज को पूरे देश में एक पहचान दी है उसके लिए पहचान दी है श्री अन्न चाहे ज्वार हो बाजरा हो वो श्री अन्न का के साथ पहचाने जाए और जब से ये काम शुरू किया है दुनिया भर में लोगों का ध्यान हमारे श्री अन्न पर गया है होम मिनिस्टर अमित शाह इज इन भीलवाड़ा in the western indian state of rajasthan where he held a public meeting minister shah was confident that prime minister modi would be reelected for the third consecutive time On the other hand opposition leader Rahul Gandhi held a public meeting at Bhagalpur in Bihar he is to address a public meeting at Amroha in Uttar Pradesh later in the day Congress leader Priyanka Gandhi held a rally at Chalakudi in the southern state of Kerala she will address a public meeting at Pattanam Ditta followed by a road show at Tiruvannandapuram the capital of the state Right, joining me from Bengaluru is my colleague Aisha Khanum. Aisha, what more can you tell us about the Prime Minister's public meeting at Chikballapura? Well, Ramo, uh, Ramesh, uh, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi will reach uh, Chikballapura and he will address uh, a mega rally there. And uh, from there onwards, Prime Minister will reach Bangalore. And this is the big and much awaited uh, rally, public uh, rally that uh, people of Karnataka are waiting because Bangalore. Uh, is the bjp bastion and bangalore has three lok sabha seats and right now uh, the bjp is in um, uh, 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 bjp is very confident about the fact that they will repeat uh, the performance and win uh, the three seats once again so prime minister narendra modi will address uh, uh, the uh, people there in chikkalapur which is about 100 kilometers away from bangalore and uh, from there he will reach uh, a bangalore palace ground uh, which is here uh, people uh, which is all the uh, preparations are on uh, there is uh, high security uh, uh, here at this uh, rally and prime minister will uh, campaign for three candidates here the bangalore north bangalore central and bangalore south so this will be an important uh, campaign uh, before karnataka goes to first phase of polling on april 26 and people are and uh, the bjp hopes that they will ride on the modi wave which is seen across the country because prime minister narendra modi is projecting development and he is also projecting 
his vision for 2047. Therefore, the youth across the country, the women and the voters across the country are looking forward to listening to Prime Minister Narendra Modi and, uh, they, uh, and they hope that, uh, you know, when Prime Minister Narendra Modi reaches here, uh, they will welcome him in a grand style which they did during the, looks, uh, during the assembly election when he came here for a grand roadshow which is etched in the memory of the people of Bangalore. As you said, Aisha, the Prime Minister will uh, next head to Bengaluru for another public meeting. How is the campaigning by the BJP alliance on the one hand and the opposition on the other for phase two of the election on 26th of April coming along? Well, the BJP and JDS alliance is really showing on the ground because this is for the first time that the BJP and JDS are working together and we see all the leaders are uh, working on ground. Uh, the, the BJP uh, workers are also, they are also in sync uh, with the uh, uh, with each other because initially there were some uh, uh, hitches with regard to the alliance but right now we see uh, there is much impact uh, on the ground and former Prime Minister uh, Deve Gowda is campaigning along with Prime Minister Narendra Modi and he is participating uh, with Prime Minister Narendra Modi and he will also be present at Chikbalapur and also um, uh, Bangalore. Uh, so JDF and BJP alliance hope uh, uh, to consolidate their vote base in Old Mysore region and also uh, in the other parts of Karnataka where JDS has its stronghold. And on the other hand, the Congress is uh, also campaigning hard because wherever uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, is campaigning, the Chief Minister of Karnataka, Sidharamaya, is also seen campaigning uh, constantly in these uh, regions because when Prime Minister Narendra Modi came to Mysore, Sidharamaya also campaigned a day before at, uh, at uh, Mysore. And similarly, the Chief Minister also campaigned at uh, Chikbalapur before uh, Prime, Minister, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's arrival. So it is a tough battle, you know, because the Congress hopes uh, that its five guarantees to the people will uh, uh, bring them uh, votes and they are hoping that uh, they will be able to improve their score because the Congress has just one seat, uh, had won just one seat in 2019 elections out of the 28 uh, uh, Lok Sabha seats and the BJP has 25. So therefore the Congress uh, hopes that because they have a government here and they hope that uh, the guarantees uh, which they have uh, promised to the people of Karnataka uh, will uh, uh, bring them uh, rich uh, dividends. So Congress, uh, BJP and JDS all uh, set for a big uh, fight and Karnataka will vote on uh, April uh, 26th which is the first phase and 14 seats, um, uh, 14 seats which is uh, majorly the southern part of Karnataka will vote for their representatives. Right, so as Aisha was pointing out, Karnataka would be one state to look out for come the second phase of election on the 26th of April. Aisha, thank you for now, appreciate it. In some more election-related news, Congress Secretary in charge of Himachal Pradesh, Tejinder Singh Bittu, joined the BJP on Saturday. The development comes as another setback to the Congress party, which has seen an exodus of high-profile leaders in recent weeks. Tejinder Singh Bittu was a close aide of Congress General Secretary Priyanka Gandhi. He joined the BJP in the presence of Minister Ashwini Vaishnav and BJP General Secretary Vinod Tawde. Now, scrutiny of nominations for Phase 3 is being held on Saturday. The third phase will be held on the 7th of May. It will encompass 94 constituencies across 12 states and union territories. Assam, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Dadra and Nagar Haveli, Daman and Diu, Goa, Gujarat, Jammu and Kashmir, Karnataka, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal will go to the polls in the third phase. And India's Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman articulated her vision of a developed India during an interaction held at the Gujarat Chamber of Commerce and Industry in Ahmedabad on Saturday. Highlighting Gujarat's prominence in renewable energy and manufacturing, Minister Sitharaman emphasized the need for India to achieve self-reliance and stand out in various sectors. In some other news, India's Chief Justice D.Y. Chandrachud hailed the enactment of the new criminal justice laws as a watershed moment. Speaking at a conference in New Delhi, he said that India was all set for a significant overhaul 
of its criminal justice system. Procedural law which governs crimes from the state of <coughs> setting the criminal process in motion to the conviction for the commission of the offence ensures that no person is charged and subsequently convicted for offences without the due process of law. The one thing which was the striking aspect of our triad of criminal laws was their age, 1860, 1872, and even 1973. And I think the enactment of these laws by Parliament is a clear indicator that India is changing, India is on the move, and that India needs new legal instruments to deal with current challenges and the challenges which we envisage for the future of our society. So that was all the news from India. Let me now get you some foreign news. Iran's foreign minister, Hossein Amirud Dalhain, has said that Iran will respond at an immediate and maximum level if Israel acts against its interests. In an interview to a U.S. media, the Iranian minister said that if Israel becomes adventurous and acts against the interests of his country, then Iran's next response would be immediate and at the maximum level. His comments followed reports of an Israeli strike on Iran on Friday. The Iranian minister said that Tehran was investigating the attack on Iran and that so far a link to Israel had not been proven. He sought to downplay the strike. Iranian media and officials alike describe a small number of explosions which they said resulted from Iran's air defenses hitting three drones over Isfahan in central Iran in the early hours of Friday. They refer to the incident as an attack by infiltrators rather than by Israel, averting the need for any retaliation. The G7 foreign ministers warn Iran that it could face further sanctions if it does anything to destabilize West Asia and the Gulf. At the end of a three-day meeting on the Italian island of Capri, the G7 also pledged to help Ukraine with its air defenses. DD India's Giles Gibson sent us this report. It was a last-minute change to the agenda of the final day of talks here on the island of Capri when reports started coming in of an apparent Israeli missile strike on central Iran. By the end of the talks, we had a joint statement from the G7 foreign ministers in which they warned Iran that further sanctions would be placed on their economy if they were responsible for any more destabilizing actions within the Middle East. Uh, first, the G7 condemned the unprecedented uh, Iranian attack on Israel, unprecedented in scope and scale. Scope because it was a direct attack on Israel from Iran, scale because it involved more than 300 uh, munitions, including ballistic missiles. We're committed to Israel's security. We're also committed to de-escalating. I immediately wanted there to be a clear message from the entire G7. The political objective of the G7 is called de-escalation. We have been working, we are working and we will continue to work to be active players for de-escalation in the whole Middle East area. Of course, on Thursday, even before these talks wrapped up, we also saw the US and the UK moving forward with a fresh round of combined sanctions on Iran. Uh, in that final statement, we also had the G7 calling for a, a sustainable ceasefire in Gaza, uh, for Hamas to release hostages that have already been held, of course, for many months and for, quotes, concrete steps to be taken by the Israeli government to allow more aid to flow into Gaza. Uh, meanwhile, this week, we've also had the Ukrainian foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, taking part in the G7 talks, in particular, urging his allies to provide his country with more air defense systems. And the G7 have now pledged to help Ukraine to bolster their air defense capabilities. However, at the end of these talks, we did not have any sign of an agreement about how to potentially leverage $300 billion of frozen Russian assets in the West to help Ukraine with their war effort. Uh, we did, in the final statement from the G7 foreign ministers, though, have a commitment. Uh, they are saying that they are going to aim to have an agreement, a deal uh, around how to use those $300 billion of frozen Russian assets by the time we get to the G7 leaders' summit which is coming up in June in southern Italy. 
Giles Gibson on the island of Capri reporting for DD India. Still to come on DD India Live. Tesla CEO Elon Musk postpones India visit. After a week-long discussion, a jury and a handful of alternates have been selected for Donald Trump's hush money trial. And North Korea tests a cruise missile warhead and a new anti-aircraft missile. of the down south pole bound karnataka national elections are more, more worried about national security the right person if you want it will take your country in a right direction voting is very important because the only rights we have it is a straight contest between the two arch rivals the ruling dispensation congress party and the principal opposition bjp You're watching DD India Live. I'm Ramesh Ramachandran. In the latest from the Russia-Ukraine conflict, the governor of Russia's western region of Smolensk on Saturday reported that a Ukrainian drone hit a fuel depot overnight, setting it on fire while an attack on the regional center has been repelled. Meanwhile, Russia also claimed to have launched multiple attacks on Ukraine's military and energy infrastructure and arms depots. It also claimed to have shot down its Ukraine's warplanes. The Russian Defense Ministry said that its army launched dozens of strikes on Ukraine's military. The Russian army destroyed Ukraine's MiG-29 fighter jets and AN-26 military transport planes at a Ukrainian airport. While Ukraine reported attacking Russian command posts, soldiers and military equipment. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky told the NATO members that his country needed a minimum of seven Patriot or other high-end air defense systems to counter Russian airstrikes. He urged them on Friday to step up their military assistance for Kyiv. We are telling this directly to defend. We need seven more Patriots or similar air defense systems and it's a minimum number. They can save many lives and really change situation. You have such systems, please, from the beginning of this year alone, a bit more than just three months, Ukraine has been hit with almost 1,200 Russian rockets, including air ballistic, and also more than 1,500 Shahids. Part of this evil we, we managed to neutralize, shoot down, but only a part. After a special meeting of Allied Defense Ministers with Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky, NATO Chief Jens Stoltenberg said the NATO allies have agreed to provide Kyiv with additional air defense systems. NATO defense ministers have agreed to step up and provide further military support including more air defense. NATO has mapped out existing capabilities across the alliance and there are systems that can be made available to Ukraine. So I expect new announcements on air defense capabilities for Ukraine soon. In addition to Patriots, there are other weapons that allies can provide, including SAMTs. And many allies have, uh, who do not have available systems have pledged uh, to provide financial support to purchase them for Ukraine. U.S. lawmakers in the lower house of the country's legislature are due to vote on Saturday on a series of long-awaited foreign aid bills that include funding for Ukraine, Israel and the Indo-Pacific. The lawmakers could give around $95 billion in U.S. funding to allies if the bills are first passed by the House of Representatives and then by the upper chamber called the Senate. DD India's Caroline Malone reports from Washington, D.C. 
It's taken months to get here, but congressional lawmakers are on the verge of making progress on approving foreign aid packages after much debate and controversy. Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson got through a procedural vote formally on Friday, which opens up the aid bills for debate before voting to pass them. That's even though 55 members of the Republican Party, his own party, voted against it, including members of the far-right House Freedom Caucus, who have said they may also move to oust him from the Speaker role in protest of the bills. Well, Johnson was only able to get to the next stage with the support of the Democrats, who, in a highly unusual bipartisan move, actually gave 165 of their votes to the courts. Well, these bills come in four parts, $60 billion for Ukraine, $26 billion for Israel, $8 billion for the Indo-Pacific, that's largely to support Taiwan, and a wider national security bill that includes moves against Russia and China, such as on fentanyl, and insisting that Beijing divest its ownership of the social platform TikTok. Well, if the bills pass in the House, they're due to be voted on on Saturday, they could then move on to the higher chamber as one complete bill. Senators are supposed to be in recess next week, but they could be called back to vote given the urgency of this funding. Caroline Malone in Washington, DD India. In some more news from the US, after nearly a week of discussions, a jury and a handful of alternates have been selected in Donald Trump's hush money trial. When Friday's proceedings were on, a man set himself on fire outside the court. It was said that the man was a conspiracy theorist and did not believe that his actions were related to the former U.S. president. Opening statements in Trump's criminal trial could begin on Monday. DD India's William Denslow has more from New York City. During legal proceedings on a Friday, the key issue that needed to be resolved was finding the six alternates uh, to go along with the 12 members of the jury that were sworn in on Thursday. That has now been achieved, which means that, according to Judge Juan Machan, we could see opening statements in Donald Trump's criminal hush money case, his trial, to begin as early as Monday. Those opening statements will provide the first opportunity for the defense and the prosecution to try and convince the jury of Donald Trump's innocence or his guilt. For the prosecution, they'll be seeking to successfully accuse Donald Trump of paying hush money to the porn star Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 elections. For the defense, they will seek to argue that the $130,000 that Donald Trump paid to his fixer at the time, Michael Cohen, was a legitimate business a legal expense. Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records. Also to be established is Judge Machan will make rulings on what exactly uh, people can ask Donald Trump if indeed he chooses to take the witness stand during this trial. There's also the matter of the gag order on Donald Trump. He says that it is unconstitutional. He says it is impacting his ability to defend himself and to politically campaign as he seeks re-election. This is really a concerted witch hunt, very simple. Everything you heard in there, this is a witch hunt by numerous judges, Democrat judges. You take a look at it, and Doran is a whack job. What he did was a disgrace. It's being reviewed by the appellate division. And I hope they do justice because everybody's looking and nobody, no business is coming into the city. For the prosecution, well, they argue that Donald Trump has been violating that gag order that essentially seeks to block him from attacking witnesses uh, and during this trial. They've warned that such violations could result in Donald Trump even facing up to 30 days behind bars. Judge Juan Machan is expected to hold a hearing on that matter on Tuesday. William Denslow in New York reporting for DD India. Tesla CEO Elon Musk on Saturday said that his visit to India has been delayed. In a post on X, Musk said, and I quote, Unfortunately, very heavy Tesla obligations require that the visit to India be delayed, but I do very much look forward to visiting later this year, unquote. Right now, take a look at what else is making news around the world. North Korea conducted a cruise missile warhead test and a new anti-aircraft missile on Friday. North Korea's strategic cruise missile is believed to be designed to carry a nuclear warhead. 
South Korea, Japan and the United States, which detect, track and report on missile tests by North Korea, made no mention of a flight, though. Rio de Janeiro's iconic Christ the Redeemer statue was lit up in green color to mark the Indigenous People's Day in Brazil. A dozen members of indigenous groups from across the country gathered at the feet of the statue to commemorate the occasion. There are few films as famous and as sinister as Hitchcock's The Birds and few instruments as little known as the Trautonium which provided the chilling sounds. The synthesizer that created the iconic sound was kept alive by a German musician. The electronic synthesizer was invented in 1930. Hitchcock was close to completing the 1963 horror film. In sports, India's Yuki Bhambri and his French partner Albano Olivetti have confirmed their place in the men's doubles finals of the Munich Open on Friday. The duo enter the final by defeating the Lucas Midler and Alexander Earl of Australia 6-1, 6-7, 10-7. This victory will strengthen Yuki's chance of qualifying for the Paris Olympics in the doubles. Bhambri and Olivetti have been in fine form of late. Earlier in the first round, they beat Sandler Jill and Joran Diligen, who are the finalists of the French Open and the champions of the Monte Carlo Masters. The ATP 250 Munich Open final will take place on Sunday. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of DD India Live. For those of you on the go, you can get all the latest news and updates on the DD India mobile app. The app is available on both Android and iOS platforms. You can scan the QR code on the screen to download now. Let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X and Instagram. You can also check out our website ddindia.co.in. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I am Ramesh Ramachandran. From all of us here in New Delhi, thanks for watching DD India Live.